The Mona Lisa. Bewitching, seductive, world famous. In the minds of millions, she is the ultimate work of art, endlessly photographed and admired. Yet behind the enigmatic smile, she remains a mystery. Who was she? Why was she painted? And what has made her the world's most famous painting? After 500 years in the spotlight, the Mona Lisa is finally giving up her secrets. Centuries-old documents are at last revealing long-forgotten truths. This is wonderful. Ooh, I've got a shiver down my spine. State-of-the-art technology is taking us beneath the painted surface to decode astonishing new evidence. <laughs> that's extraordinary. <laughs> wow, that's quite a big discovery, isn't it? Yes, it is. This investigation, the first full forensic examination of the latest discoveries, takes me round the world in the hunt for the truth about Leonardo da Vinci's masterpiece with exclusive access and some extraordinary encounters. <laughs> the first impression when I came in was, I, I did well not to jump backwards in, in shock. These revelations will change everything we thought we knew about history's most enigmatic work of art. That's great, so we just made a new discovery and unlocked the secrets of the Mona Lisa. All of this together marks an extraordinary moment in the history of art. But more than that, this is quite simply one of the stories of the century. Five hundred years ago, a man painted a woman. The man was Leonardo da Vinci, artist, inventor, genius. And the result of his work was the inscrutable portrait we now know as the Mona Lisa. It's a masterpiece, and one of the few works he actually finished. So what draws us to the Mona Lisa? She's not a famous monarch or a legendary historical figure. We know hardly anything about her. So what is it about this picture that's gripped the human imagination for so many centuries? I want to begin my investigation by comparing notes with a detective who's been on the case for more than 30 years. One of the world's leading experts on Leonardo da Vinci Oxford professor Martin Kemp has spent much of his life obsessed by the mystery of the Mona Lisa. What do you think is the, the key to the Mona Lisa's extraordinary stature as, without doubt, the world's most famous painting? Well, it has to be something inherent in the picture. Some things are famous for being famous, and we live in an age of celebrity, and lots of celebrities are famous for being famous, but they're not going to last. This has gone on for ages. It is just extraordinary. And you've got this sense of a, something which is beyond pigment and beyond a good likeness and being beyond a face, and it, it just has that totally uncanny living presence. It's very daring at the time for a woman in a portrait to look at you. you know, women's portraits simply didn't do that. And I think the ambiguity, the uh, the tease, the visual tease, is, uh, is, is something that Leonardo absolutely cultivated. Look at the Mona Lisa, and you can't help feeling there's more going on than meets the eye. If her teasing smile's a question mark, the painting's a riddle. What makes a human being live and breathe? What forces govern the world we live in? Leonardo thought about these questions as deeply as anyone. And behind this breathtakingly lifelike image lay years of investigation into spheres of knowledge like geology and anatomy, some of which were forbidden by the church. Tantalizing evidence for the research that went into the Mona Lisa lies hidden in Windsor Castle. Amongst the gems of the royal collection is an intriguing clue to the genesis of the portrait a page from what might be called 
the real Da Vinci Code. If you want to see or have some sense of just how much work there was behind the surface of the picture, then this is a great place to start. It's a sheet of drawings by Leonardo's own hand. And what does it contain in faint outline? Look here. <laughs> it's a bit like the Cheshire Cat. It's the Mona Lisa's smile without the Mona Lisa attached. It may well have been Leonardo's first gropings towards his idea for the painting. It's a series of studies of the human mouth, the motions of the mouth, how the mouth puckers, how the mouth bears its teeth. You have a very strong sense that for Leonardo, every picture is a kind of encyclopedia entry. And this is just that part of it, dealing with the mouth. It's just the tip of the iceberg. The Mona Lisa is the work into which Leonardo poured everything he knew about humanity and the world that surrounds us with its ceaseless play of light and shade. But there's a mystery there too, and it's staring us in the face. Who is the woman with the enigmatic smile? It's a question that has fueled all kinds of speculation, ranging from the ingenious to the crackpot. She's a pregnant mother-to-be. She's a prostitute. She's even a man in drag. But if you look beyond the theories, there are clues to her true identity. Florence, 1500. After many years away, Leonardo da Vinci has returned to the city of his youth. He's come back to work on ambitious military projects for powerful men. He says he's too busy to paint portraits of wealthy aristocrats who clamor after him. Yet according to one writer, Leonardo somehow finds time to paint the portrait, not of a noblewoman, but of a humble merchant's wife called Lisa. It was here that Leonardo da Vinci began the most famous painting in the world. And it was here that Giorgio Vasari, the inventor of the very idea of the Renaissance, the author of the very first book about the Renaissance, produced Exhibit A in the case of the Mona Lisa, the very first account of the painting. Who was she? She was the wife of Francesco del Giocondo, a rich merchant. He commissioned Leonardo to create her portrait, and Leonardo responded with a picture, says Vasari, so miraculously lifelike that it seems to be made of flesh, not paint. Leonardo, he says, wanted to avoid the melancholy that dominates so many other portraits, so he employed musicians, entertainers, buffoons to keep her amused. So there you have it the wife of Francesco del Giocondo, and the smile caused by entertainers hired by the artist. An open and shut case, or is it? How can we be sure that Vasari was right and that Leonardo did indeed paint Lisa del Giocondo? After all, Vasari wrote his account 30 years after Leonardo's death. And although he did his homework here in Florence, he never disclosed his sources. So could it just be hearsay, some inaccurate local legend? For centuries, there was no way of telling. Then, suddenly, new evidence emerged from a completely unexpected source. In 2006, a research scholar working in the University Library of Heidelberg turned up this what it is, is a page from a copy of Cicero, the ancient Roman author, a book that was once owned here in Florence by a man called Agostino Vespucci. And not only does it have Cicero's text, but it's got Vespucci's commentaries. And this particular passage is crucial because in it, Cicero is discussing Apelles, the ancient Greek artist. And 
His remarks prompt Vespucci to make his own notes, his marginal note. And what he writes is a kind of bombshell in the history of Leonardo's studies. He says, Apelles, ah, he did just the same thing as Leonardo in his portrait of Lisa del Giocondo. And best of all, there's a date, October 1503. So this was written almost immediately after Vespucci must have seen the portrait of Lisa del Giocondo in Leonardo da Vinci's workshop. This is gold dust, and it proves that Vasari was definitely right in at least one sense all along. Leonardo definitely did paint a portrait of Lisa del Giocondo. There you have it. Independent testimony from a man in Florence in 1503 who probably saw the picture still wet on the artist's easel. But now there's another question. Why did Leonardo paint Lisa? When the great and powerful couldn't coax a picture from him, why agree to paint this obscure woman? One man has made it his life's work to uncover forgotten secrets about Lisa. Giuseppe Palanti has found new details in the city archive. Historical dynamite. Beginning with the house where Lisa, daughter of the Gerardinis, was born. On this street, this is the street where the Mona yes. Lisa once lived. Yes, Lisa lived in the dark and narrow street of Florence. What, what was her family background? Uh, la major la maggior parte delle famiglie erano piccoli artigiani. So they were small work, as it were, laborers? Eh, so, allora, non è, non, è, non è una grande donna. Non... No, e dove, nasce, dove è nata Lisa? Eh, era un'antica bottega per la lavorazione della lana che fu trasformata in abitazione. E, e dà un'idea di una famiglia che non ha grandi ricchezze, perché i Gerardini non ebbero mai una casa propria a Firenze. They e... never had their own house in no. Florence. Giuseppe's discoveries have deepened the mystery. If Lisa's origins were so humble, why did the notoriously choosy Leonardo consent to paint her? In another part of town, Giuseppe believes he's found the answer. Siamo qui per vedere la casa, il luogo dove Lisa ha incontrato Francesco del Giocondo e ha sposato Francesco del Giocondo. The, the, the place is there. It is important for another reason, because in front of this building lived Ser Piero, Leonardo's father. Well, hang on, say that again. Lisa Gerardini was living here at the it, time. Yes. Leonardo da Vinci's father was living there. Yes, penso che Francesco che Leonardo sia stato dal babbo a trovare il babbo, per cui la famiglia del, di, Fran, di Leonardo da Vinci viveva quasi di fronte alla casa di Mona Lisa. Oh, incredible! C'è un'altra connessione, un altro collegamento. Francesco del Giocondo era cliente di Serpiero. Serpiero era uno dei più influenti e importanti notai di Firenze. So he was a you're saying that Francesco del Giocondo, the merchant, he was actually a client of Leonardo's father? Yes. Well, this is all new. Yes. This uh, is all new. For the first time, we have a concrete connection between Leonardo and Lisa. Not only were they neighbors, their families did business together. And there's more. Giuseppe tells me that according to police records of the time, Francesco had a bit of a reputation. Described as garoso, meaning swaggering, he wasn't just a merchant on the rise, but an aggressive dealmaker who'd stop at almost nothing to get his way. Maybe this is the real reason Leonardo agreed to paint his wife. Maybe Francesco made him an offer he couldn't refuse. In the parish church of San Lorenzo, there's another crucial piece of evidence, something that had slipped through the net of history until just a few years ago, when Giuseppe found it, the record of Mona Lisa's death. 
wonderful thing. The handwriting isn't very easy to follow because the entries in these books weren't actually made by notaries like Leonardo da Vinci's father. They were actually made by the priests in the church. But I think I have found her. Here she is. This is wonderful. Ooh, I've got a shiver down my spine. Lisa, Donna, Fudi, Francesco del Giocondo. So, Lisa, the wife of Francesco del Giocondo, Mori, died on the 15th of July, 1542. Just... I think what I love about this is this is truth. You know, what could be more true than the record of somebody's death? She was a real person. She was a real person. And there's one other sentence in this entry which my friend Palanti didn't mention. It says that she was buried in Santa Ursula. He told me that. But what he didn't say is this last sentence, tolsa tutto il capito. Four words. She took with her the whole capitolo. What that means is that her body was followed by the whole body of the Church of San Lorenzo. So what is conjured up by this is a very, very grand funeral. And for this brief moment, in July 1542, she was a very, very important person in the life of the city. Everybody in Florence would have known that Mona Lisa had passed away. A spectacular funeral. Dozens of canons, chaplains and clerics, the whole Del Giocondo clan, walking with Lisa's coffin. Francesco had died five years earlier, but he made sure he provided for all this pomp and ceremony in his will, where she's described as his beloved, faithful wife. Lisa del Giocondo was laid to rest in the now ruined convent of Sant'Ursola. Beyond here, we can't follow her, though we've learned a lot. Leonardo definitely knew Lisa, definitely painted her portrait. But if one riddle's been answered, there's still another mystery to solve. How can we be certain that Leonardo's portrait of Lisa and the portrait in the Louvre are one and the same? So what are the facts? According to Vasari, Leonardo painted Lisa smiling in Florence. Vespucci's marginal notes confirm that it happened in 1503. The picture in the Louvre shows a woman smiling. So far, so good. But other things don't add up. Vasari describes eyebrows. But the Louvre portrait doesn't have eyebrows. Vasari tells us Leonardo painted Lisa for Francesco del Giocondo. But Francesco never owned the portrait we now call the Mona Lisa. Leonardo had it with him when he died. Most troubling of all is an eyewitness account written by a man called Antonio de Beatis. He was actually shown the picture that's now in the Louvre by Leonardo himself at the end of his life. Leonardo said he'd been asked to paint this portrait not by Francesco del Giocondo, but by someone completely different a noble patron, Giuliano de' Medici. It simply doesn't make sense. It's almost as if we might be talking about different paintings. So I'm beginning to wonder whether it's not possible that Leonardo did paint two versions of the same painting on several occasions. I'm beginning to wonder if it's not possible that he did indeed finish his portrait of the Mona Lisa here in Florence, that he did indeed give it to Francesco del Giocondo, and that the portrait of Mona Lisa in Paris is a second version. Is it possible that there might be more than one Mona Lisa? 
The idea is not as strange as you might think. Leonardo did habitually revisit the same subject more than once. I've come to Singapore to see for the first time a picture that might actually be Leonardo's first version of the painting. It's owned by an anonymous consortium of businessmen and is currently locked away deep in the bowels of a state-of-the-art high-security storage facility. So could this be the first Mona Lisa? I've come 7,000 miles to see you. Blimey. The background's, you might almost say, a kind of roughing in. But the face... Face is really something. She's younger, she's smiling. I think there's a lot to be said for first impressions. And uh, <laughs> the first impression when I came in was... I, I did well not to jump backwards in, in shock. It's too good, in my opinion, for any of the other school of Leonardo painters. Very dangerous things like this, They're very dangerous to say this is definitely painted by Leonardo da Vinci. Well, I can't say that, but I think it's not beyond the realms of possibility that this is the picture that Francesco del Giocondo took. And then the Leonardo goes off, paints another picture based on the memory of this picture. And that's the Mona Lisa we know in the Louvre. It's very teasing, that smile, isn't it? Very teasing. This version of the Mona Lisa first hit the headlines in 1914. British art dealer Hugh Blaker bought it from a private family collection and was convinced he'd stumbled across an early Leonardo. He kept it in his Isleworth studios and it became known as the Isleworth Mona Lisa. One thing in its favour was its similarity to this pencil sketch copy of the Mona Lisa, done in Florence in 1504 by Leonardo's contemporary Raphael, which seems to show how the painting looked in its original state. Yet after a century of supporters, detractors and different owners, opinion on the Isleworth painting is still divided. One man who is convinced that Leonardo painted two Mona Lisas is Jean-Pierre Isbouts. He was so impressed by the Isleworth portrait, he wrote a book about it. So what would lead you to think that the Isleworth picture was indeed painted in 1503? What is to say that it wasn't painted in 1553? Well, and I don't know about you, but when you talk about a copy, usually a copy tries to imitate the original. This is not a copy. There are so many different things about this particular Isleworth version that do not appear in the Louvre version. Let's take one example. The columns. The portrait is framed by two robust Doric columns. Why do we know that those columns existed in 1503 and not later on? Because there is Raphael. He makes a sketch. And what do we have on both sides? We have the columns that appear in the Isleworth. They do not appear in the Louvre version. So let's talk about the uh, record written by De Beatis, the secretary to Cardinal D'Aragon, who visited Leonardo in 1516. Which, which is seriously puzzling. Which is seriously puzzling. But here is, here we have an eyewitness account. Here they are in the room with Leonardo. Uh, and he says, yeah, this, this was done at the request of Giuliano de Medici. Instigazione. Instigazione. I think what he was doing at this time is give Giuliano credit. Giuliano bailed Leonardo out when Leonardo was without 
the mentor Canalis. And that's when Leonardo, because of the patronage and the financial support of Giuliano, finds the time to create this new meditation, if you will, the Louvre version. So your explanation would be, well, here we are. Two different explanations, but then that's not so weird if you think there are two different pictures. Exactly. Jean-Pierre firmly believes this could be Leonardo's first Mona Lisa, done for husband Francesco. But if so, why would it be unfinished? Well, we know Leonardo was slow and Francesco was impatient. So perhaps he just snatched it away from Leonardo once his beloved Lisa's face was complete. A barrage of scientific tests have been carried out on this tantalizing picture. The canvas was carbon dated to around the right period. Multiple tiny paint samples are consistent with the paints Leonardo used. X-ray, infrared and ultraviolet scans have found nothing to disprove it as an early Mona Lisa. But that's the problem. All that conventional tests can do is rule out a possible Leonardo. What about positive confirmation? An eminent scientist based in San Diego, California, has been looking for a solution. Hello. Good to see you, Andrew. Dr. John Asmus is a well-respected nuclear physicist and a pioneer in the analysis of historic paintings. He's one of very few who've been allowed to examine the Louvre Mona Lisa. And that's why the owners of the Isleworth Mona Lisa tracked him down. I started receiving phone calls from a series of, uh, of attorneys in Switzerland, and they wanted me to look at a painting. And finally, they, we found that I was going to be on a train from Milan to Geneva, and they asked me to get off the train in Lausanne and take a look at their painting. And so they met me at the train station, and they popped the bonnet of, a, of an automobile, and uh, there was a Mona Lisa in, in, in the trunk. <laughs> and, and, the, and the attorney asked me, do you think this Mona Lisa was painted by Leonardo? And my exact <laughs> words were, how would I know? So uh, I got out my Instamatic camera and took a photograph of the painting in the trunk. And it was that image that I com then compared with the Louvre Mona Lisa. A few years ago, Dr. Asmus developed a new test to authenticate paintings by Rembrandt. It compares the subtle distribution of light and shadow, measured as histograms, to isolate an artist's unique way of painting. I think it's a, a way of trying to quantify the artist's eye. Every artist has certain uh, effects that he's trying to accomplish. And we use Rembrandt as a test case and the results were rather encouraging. We came up with some general rules as to how Rembrandt did his blending and his selection of, of pigments. So I tried that, that same technique on the Isleworth Mona Lisa and, and comparing it with the Louvre Mona Lisa. And I was, I was stunned. The correlation between those two histograms was 99%, stronger than it was between any histograms of any of the Rembrandt self-portraits that we've looked at. How, how amazing. This demonstrates that the technique for blending light and shade in each face appears uncannily similar. John plans to build a much bigger database of Leonardo works with which to compare them. His results are impressive. But there's something still troubling me. I would love to believe that that softly emerging face coming out of darkness really is young Mona Lisa. I'd love to believe that. But at the moment, for me, it's that too good to be true syndrome. It's a little bit too good. It's troubling when I look at that chart that they've done of where they've taken the paint samples from. They've taken the paint samples from everywhere except that beguiling face, which is the most compelling part of the whole picture. It's the part that makes you think, yes, 
This could be the young Mona Lisa. I'm just wondering whether it's possible that some very skillful, careful restorer, sometime before John Asmus saw it in the boot of that car, didn't just bring that face up. Didn't just make whatever ghost or trace or possibly a Mona Lisa copy into something so much more compelling to the modern eye. To me, not to test that is it, it's like a detective and his team coming to investigate the scene of a crime, the scene of a murder, and fingerprinting every square inch of it, but forgetting to take fingerprints from the knife on the bed covered with blood. I could be wrong. Maybe Leonardo did paint this face in 1503 while Lisa sat in front of him. But until the face is tested, doubt remains. And to me, she just looks a bit too 20th century. But I'm still convinced that Leonardo did paint two Mona Lisas. If the Isleworth painting isn't the earlier version, then it's either lost or still out there somewhere. And believe it or not, now there's a new lead. The reported discovery of another Mona Lisa in St. Petersburg, Russia. This really is a plunge into the unknown. All we've been told is that a wealthy Russian art collector, identity a secret, recently acquired a painting that might be the missing link to the mystery. We haven't yet been told where it is. And then, at the last minute, we're given an address. A place with a dubious past. Strange. This building was created in the 19th century. This room is a recreation of an old Russian hunting lodge. It survives because the KGB made it their headquarters during the communist years. Here she is. So what is this? What is this? All I know about this picture is that it was purchased by a Russian art collector from a very old and established American family who'd had it since the end of the 18th century and has hardly been seen since. And what's the status of this picture? Smaller, the columns are more complete than they are in the version in the Louvre. <laughs> you see, they've got me going. <laughs> I'm saying the version in the Louvre, the version in the Louvre. The Mona Lisa in the Louvre. She's enigmatic. She's removed. She's distant. Is she a copy? Not sure. This picture looks tantalizingly close to the picture in the Louvre. So many details are the same. But is this Leonardo's lost earlier version? As with the Isleworth picture, scientific tests have been done by Dr. Chiara Matteucci of the University of Bologna, who's flown to Russia to share her results. Dunque, se guardiamo solo la scienza, Direi che possiamo partire dal supporto. This is the radiocarbon dating of the canvas, sì. which shows a 95.4% probability that the canvas is between 1490 and 1670. So the canvas could well be correct. Sì. Okay. 
In realtà chi, il dato che ci svela il possibile, il probabile periodo non è tanto la tela ma eh, il, lo strato eh, preparatorio del, del dipinto. Al di sopra della tela eh, vi è la presenza di un eh, ground, di una preparazione rossa. Rossa? Rossa. Oh, that's the ground. Well, that's very clear. So, but as far as I understand it, Leonardo da Vinci himself worked on a classic Italian Renaissance ground of white. Is that right? Dunque, sì. The presence of a red ground, the very first layer of paint, seems to discount Leonardo's hand. But it's Chiara's next discovery that really changes the picture. A chemical not used before 1600. Il interessante è il avere rinvenuto nella preparazione la, il solfato del, degli, degli inclusi di solfato di bario ci può indirizzare ad un periodo eh, molto ristretto. Nel periodo tra il 1620 e il 1680 ehm, l'utilizzo della baritina eh, in queste preparazioni era molto comune in Francia, proprio Solo nell'area Francia. proprio no, sì. non è, Allora, questa è una trova uh, fisica, una, una cosa chimica. Sì, nell'area parigina eh, nel periodo che abbiamo, di cui abbiamo parlato, un, un mercante di pigmenti aveva messo a punto un, un, un prodotto proprio specifico per le preparazioni eh, in cui veniva aggiunta appunto baritina. I think Chiara has done all the research we need to know. So the barium allows us to place this canvas very precisely, 1620 to 1680, and probably in Paris. So all the painters around Paris got this ground from this one guy and put it on their canvas. So more and more that I talk to you, I feel noi parliamo italiano e io penso che devo parlare in francese alla, alla donna qua. Je suis, je suis enchanté de faire uh, ta connaissance Mona Lisa. Uh, tu, es, tu, es, tu es sans doute française. So this Mona Lisa isn't a Leonardo, but a mid-17th century French copy. In fact, there are dozens of copies. It's a real problem if you believe, as I think you have to, given the conflicting evidence, that Leonardo did paint two Mona Lisas. What we're looking for, then, is Leonardo's image of young Lisa, as described by Vasari, as sketched by Raphael, which must predate the famous picture in the Louvre. So where can it be? I still believe that I can get to the bottom of the mystery, because there's one very strong lead I haven't yet followed up. One more destination, Paris. A scientist turned art detective claims he can finally explain the discrepancies. He believes the secrets of the Mona Lisa lie not in other versions of the portrait, but inside the Mona Lisa itself. And he reckons he can prove it. Pascal. Rhythm. Pascal Cott is one of the world's leading experts in the analysis of paintings. He's a man in Leonardo's own image a self-taught physicist, the brilliant inventor of a new technique that's unlocked the secrets of paintings by Rubens, Rembrandt, Picasso, and many others. His work on another Leonardo painting, The Lady with an Ermine, revealed earlier versions of the composition, hidden beneath its surface, that rewrote art history. But his great obsession is the Mona Lisa, faithfully reproduced here in his studio. In 2004, Pascal was invited by the Louvre to scan the painting. His task? Simply to identify the picture's original colours, hidden beneath the discolorations of time. 
But Pascal's technique also revealed that there was far more going on beneath the surface. For the last decade, he's worked in secret decoding those discoveries. And now he's ready to share them. Our goal is to peel like an onion <laughs> all the layer of paint to reconstruct the chronology of the construction of the painting. So is this and new? Is this a new? This is a new technique, absolutely. Pascal's secret weapon is his groundbreaking multi-spectral camera, an invention truly worthy of Leonardo. 13 different wavelengths of color are projected onto the picture, each penetrating the paint surface to a different depth. The camera captures the reflections, generating over three billion bits of data and thousands of images. By analyzing each image shown in black and white, Pascal can reveal a painting's secrets, layer by layer. His first discovery in the Mona Lisa is buried deep within the painting. What we discover, we discover that the head was bigger. So you, you see a shadow yes, of a bigger that. head. Mm. You can see also that the nose is double here. Oh. Wow. So once she had a larger head. And I discovered this hand much more bigger. Pascal has pieced together several previously unknown details that lie beneath the Louvre portrait as we know it. Marked in red, they seem to be elements of a larger first portrait that never got beyond a draft stage. But that's just the beginning of Pascal's discoveries. So now we will continue with one other layer. Voilà, here we are. What on earth is that? What is it? This is a hairpin. Like this one. So you found... Something like you, this. You found... An, it, with that little bit of your magic light camera, you found a missing hairpin. Now you know there is a hairpin. You can see it. Ha! Ah. Because you know. But, yes, no, exactly. How fascinating. And more than that, if you look around the head, you discover 12 hairpins. <laughs> the hairpins with pearls make no sense on the first large portrait. But Pascal has found something else that appears to be connected to them. Tiny rows of dots, known as spolvery. They seem to suggest an elaborate headdress. Intriguingly, a type of headdress that, as far as we know, was only ever shown on the heads of saints or madonnas. This is a painting of a headdress that have nothing to do with Mona Lisa. Nothing to do with Mona Lisa? Nothing to do with Mona Lisa. The spolvery hidden inside the Mona Lisa have never been seen before. They're concrete proof of the way Leonardo constructed a picture. He would have begun with a preparatory drawing, marked the lines on tracing paper with a sharp point, then transferred those outlines onto the wood with coal dust. But what happened to the headdress? Pascal's next piece of evidence suggests it was deliberately removed. So now I discover this hatching. You see this hatching? This is another layer of your... Yeah, another, another ...of the layer. onion. So this is Leonardo with his rubber. Yes. You see, it's totally different from the cracks. It's not crackalure. No. You, you see, this is clearly to erase what is behind. It's very important because that explains how Leonardo, from one stage, go to another stage. Pascal's scans are crucial evidence of the way Leonardo worked building up a painting stage by stage. 
Above the scratchings, Pascal reveals the first impression of yet another layer, the ghostly imprint of a face, like a Leonardo Turin shroud. Is that another head? Yes. How many heads is that so far? Uh, this is the number three. So the big head. The big head. The, the pearl head. The pearl head. And then there's another head. Yes. Now the, the height. So it's a wonderful proof. I discovered two crosses just here. Oh my. <laughs> That's extraordinary. And these crosses do not match with Mona Lisa uh, glance. No. No. The crosses clearly mark a different set of pupils, looking in a different direction. The face behind Mona Lisa, mm. the face is turned 14 degrees in the right direction. So there she is, she's looking like that, so she should be like that. Yeah. More like that. Also eyebrows. Can this... I just see this, because this is an important point, because Vasari says, specifically, you know, that the eyebrows are beautifully painted. Yes, these eyebrows. Mona Lisa, as we yes. see her, doesn't have eyebrows. So have you found... You can see it. Yeah, they see her here. So there are the eyebrows. And here you have another mouse. Look at this mouse. Nothing to do with Mona Lisa. Absolutely amazing. She's barely smiling. Do you see? Because she, she turns the head on the left, the mouth is a little smaller. Quite you a see? lot smaller. Yeah. <laughs> so, Pascal, you found a complete face. Uh, yes. Inside. Inside. The Mona Lisa. Yes. <laughs> wow. That's quite a big discovery, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes it, is. yes, it is. Pascal's work has revealed, for the first time in 500 years, a detailed earlier portrait by Leonardo da Vinci. It's the same size as the face we see now, but turned by 14 degrees. There's clear evidence of a different, swept back hairstyle. Elaborate ties at the top of an earlier sleeve are clearly visible. There's even a suggestion that she once held a blanket in her lap. Is this the portrait of Lisa I've been looking for? So throughout my journey, I thought, well, it seems, it seems as though they're talking about two different pictures. You seem to be saying to me, Yes, there are two Mona Lisas, but they happen to be on the same piece of wood. Yes. So this must surely be Lisa del Giocondo. Of course. Francesca's wife. I agree with you. It's, it's, this is a real portrait of Mrs. Uh, Lisa Gardini. Pascal's pioneering work marks an extraordinary moment in the history of art. By piecing together all the details, then decoding the data to identify the original pigments used by Leonardo, Pascal has been able to construct a digital photo fit of the image. It's a perfect match with the historical record. But if this computer image represents the original portrait of Mona Lisa, it's a portrait her husband never received. Instead, Leonardo went on to paint the world's most famous picture, over the top. So there were two Mona Lisas all along. But how do we make sense of these discoveries? And what are we now to make of Leonardo's masterpiece? In search of the final piece to the puzzle, I'm meeting a woman who spent years reconstructing the scene on that day, back in 1503, when Leonardo started to paint Lisa. Leading expert on Renaissance hairstyles and costumes, Elisabetta Nignera, 
has based her work closely on Pascal's findings. Every Renaissance fashion can be precisely pinpointed, whether to Rome in 1512 or Florence in 1503. So by recreating the costume Pascal found in the painting beneath the painting, Elisabetta can place and date it very precisely. Her results are a revelation. Looking at the fashions shown in these other contemporary portraits, this lady perfectly fits with the historical image of a wealthy Florentine lady of the very early years of the 16th century. I uh, cannot see any inconsistencies. So this must be Lisa del Draconda, as Raphael painted her. Yes, this is very close. The closest version we know to the Raphael sketch is like a Polaroid. It's like a Polaroid. Yeah. Raphael had actually seen Leonardo's portrait of Lisa when he drew this copy in 1504. Apart from one slight difference, the veil over the bodice, it's identical to Elisabetta's reconstruction and Pascal's photo fit. It's compelling evidence that Pascal has indeed found the first version, Leonardo's original Lisa, lurking beneath the finished work. But where does all this leave the picture we see today? So, Elisabetta, when you look at the Mona Lisa in the Louvre, as she is now, from the point of view of costume, what do you see? To me, she's not a real person because there are so many details which go in this sense. Mm. Can you give me an example? Yeah. Uh, the long hair worn uh, on uh, her shoulder. This wouldn't be conceivable unless you had the very high ranks or it was a posthumous portrait. What about this sort of sash of drapery that comes over her shoulder? The twist. Yeah. This is the most uh, interesting element in uh, Louvre's Gioconda because a Greek or Roman uh, classical art devoted such a detail only on one shoulder only to Venus, Venus, and uh, virtues like purity, chastity, faith. So that, that beautiful strand of drapery that seems to continue the flow of the river yeah. and the landscape behind, that is not something real. that a real woman no, would have worn. at all. Even so it's, an a, it's more like an attribute of a goddess. Yes. So the Louvre painting shows an idealised woman, maybe a posthumous portrait. Surely, then, she can no longer be Mona Lisa, because Mona Lisa outlived Leonardo. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> now, for Elisabetta, the moment of truth. As the results of years of research and hard work finally come together, we can at last see how Lisa del Giocondo, the original Mona Lisa, might have looked. So, Elisabetta, yeah. you have made the sleeves yeah. that Pascal found, and this is the line. You've recreated the yeah, line exactly. there. Yeah, exactly. It's been an elaborate process, but it leads to a genuine insight into Leonardo's obsessive relationship with this painting. The key is in the colours, which have been exactly matched to Pascal's calculations. The dress for the bodies. He found a, 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 a greenish-grey pigment. Mm. And also the sleeves, we know how Leonardo would call this colour, which was called Leonato, that is, the colours of the lion's fur. Leonato colour. I never knew that. I never knew that. But you know what it makes me think? It makes me think, when you say that, that this is, this is Leonardo, because, of course, he didn't sign pictures, but this is Leonardo's way of signing... The painting. Exactly. You love to play games with words. Exactly. So the color, that's great. The color, Leonardo, uh. and the knot pattern, vincere. Yeah. Leonardo da Vinci. Yeah. It could be, no, we're not joking. I, I agree no, with you totally. You agree with me. Yeah, exactly. Because. 
For May, the presence of a hidden signature would answer a nagging question. Why didn't he finish his first version and give it to Francesca? Knotting his name into her bodice, it's like an act of possession. As if Leonardo knew this was always destined to be more than a portrait. No one's painting but his own. If we go one, two, three, quando dico tre, you look at me. Uno, due, tre. Our investigation has revealed for the first time what Leonardo's hidden earlier portrait might have looked like. The portrait, surely, of the Florentine merchant's wife, Lisa del Giacondo. We found a solution to the historic inconsistencies that have long baffled experts. And it seems we've discovered that the portrait in the Louvre may not be the Mona Lisa after all. So we're left with the million dollar question. Who is she? The one piece of evidence that still stands out is the eyewitness account of De Beatis, who had it from Leonardo himself, that the woman we now see was painted at the behest of Giuliano de Medici. So who replaced Mona Lisa in Leonardo's painting? Did Giuliano commission a posthumous portrait? perhaps of a lost love, idealized like a goddess? For me, there's only one candidate, a woman with whom Giuliano had a brief, passionate affair, a woman who tragically died giving birth to their son, a little boy who was still calling for her when Giuliano commissioned the picture. Her name was Pacifica Brandano. Could this be her? It's a romantic notion. But just as Leonardo never gave the picture to Francesco, he never gave it to Giuliano either. Instead, he kept the image of the woman he'd signed in code and made her more his own than ever. At the end of Leonardo's life, the Mona Lisa, this shape-shifting picture that had begun as the portrait of one woman and then metamorphosed into another, became something else again, namely a work of art that transcended portraiture and turned into an expression of all his knowledge, all his philosophy. The painting's like a shimmering mosaic in which Leonardo has pieced together all that he knows about nature and about human nature. And I think the key to it is that famous smile. Leonardo's way of saying that while we might strive to understand this vast cosmos that surrounds us, in the end it's our destiny to pass through life as swiftly as the smile that flickers across a human face. So the Mona Lisa really isn't Mona Lisa after all, but something much more than that. It's a painting of life itself, as Leonardo had come to think of it. His way of painting us all. Coming up on BBC Two, Ruth Jones and Ramesh Ranganathan join Jack D for The Apprentice You're Fired next. <laughs>